thanks everybody for getting together and uh, talk about the people against COVID-19. It's a serious crisis. And uh, Chris, thank you for starting this ball rolling um, and letting us all get involved. And Tiffany, thanks for coming and joining us um, to ask questions of everybody. I suppose we could go around the virtual room and, and say who we are. Um, Chris, why don't you start since you started the whole thing? Sure. Uh, I'm Chris Stewart, uh, managing partner of Stewart Trial Attorneys. Um, why this started? I mean, I have a lot of friends who are doctors. Um, where I went to college, most people go there to become a doctor. I wasn't smart enough, uh, so I became a lawyer. And um, I talk to them all the time. A lot of my fraternity brothers down here, and they're struggling. I mean, they you know didn't have enough masks at first. Um, and then I started just hearing a lot about morale being down at the hospitals. Um, and from those discussions, I started hearing simple things like, I mean, they just can't go out and get something to eat because they're working double, triple shifts. You can't run the McDonald's like you used to because they're all closed or um, the lines are ridiculous. Um, so then the idea came of trying to keep local businesses in, you know, going because they don't have customers. Hospitals need food. So put those two together. Yeah. Barbara, why don't you introduce yourself to us? Sure. Hey, uh, I'm Barbara Marshalk. I'm a lawyer at Drew Echo and Farnham. I'm a defense lawyer, boo, <laughs> which means I'm always on the right side of the V is what I tell people. Um, but I listen, I appreciate Jeff reaching out to me on this and giving, giving folks like me on the defense side the opportunity to be a part of this. I, I think that a lot of times people overlook us. Um, and you guys are great at organizing. You have a phenomenal um, kind of tree where you can reach out to everybody by the GTLA listserv. Um, and so I think it was great that you reached out to us and hopefully my fellow members of the defense bar are paying attention to, I've already seen some, some stuff on Facebook where they are. Absolutely, so thank you. Thank you a lot for joining this party. And, and as you said, um, there've already been some folks that I know you reached who have chipped in to start to help because either I didn't know them or they didn't like me, so it had to be you. Well, maybe <laughs> some other guys. I don't know. But it was not me either. <laughs> <laughs> maybe it was Moses. Moses, tell us who you are and what you're about. Well, hello. I'm Moses Kim. I'm the founding partner of the Moses Firm here in Atlanta. And um, I, I just appreciate everyone and Chris and Jeff for inviting me and letting me participate in just this amazing effort you've put together. Uh, to support some really uh, needed and uh, important people in all our communities, the nurses and the doctors who are risking their own lives uh, and uh, their, their family time and their health to uh, take care of people. And in my line of work, I spend a lot of time criticizing nurses and doctors, but I just want uh, the community to know and on behalf of the warrior community and our peers and colleagues that uh, we need a lot of good doctors and nurses. And this is just such an important time to encourage them, as Chris says, and to lift them up for doing everything they're doing by sacrificing uh, not only their their uh, time away from their family, but also their own personal health. And we just want to let everyone know how much we appreciate that. And Tiffany, why don't you tell us who you are and what your roles are going to be this evening? Oh, um, I'm Tiffany Lee. I do marketing for Stewart Trial Attorneys. Um, tonight, I'm going to be interviewing you guys um, and you guys' involvement with this movement, um, the People versus COVID-19, and we appreciate you guys being a part of this. I think it's a very important movement, um, and I'm just here to help and assist. Good deal. AKA, she runs my life at the firm, so. And I'm his personal assistant. <laughs> Through two days of email about this, I had that figured out. Yeah. <laughs> I don't even know how to work Zoom. She had to tell me. <laughs> so yeah, that that's me. So I'm glad that we're here. And Jeb, what about you? Um, Jeb Butler with the Butler Law Firm. Um, I was happy to let me wave my lights back on. There we go. Uh, I was happy to get involved in this program when um, Chris gave me the opportunity. We were texting with some friends, and he said he wanted to get it together. And so. Um, I raised my hand first, I guess, and through a dearth of other options, you know, here I am talking with everybody about it. 
Uh, my law firm does wrongful death, personal injury cases like Chris does. And, uh, we're excited to pitch in with people who do all kinds of different things. I, I imagine that I know that Barbara and I have had cases against one another. I suspect that may be true of her and some of these other guys. I know I've worked with, uh, with I think, everybody on here on something or another. So it's good to be pitched in together on a common goal that is important, I feel like, to us and to our country. So happy to be here. Awesome. Well, Jeb, did you want me to go ahead and just jump right in with these questions? Yeah, please do. All right, so we will start with, um, I guess we can go ahead and start back with Mr. Stewart. Um, and the question is, what motivated you to want to pitch in and help um, with this project and help the people, I guess you can say, of the project? Um, aside from, like I said, the relationships that I have with a lot of doctors, having you know, gone to school with them, still being close with a lot of them, um, being lawyers, plaintiff for defense, we're kind of type A personalities. So us sitting at home, being on the sideline is um, foreign for us. Uh, so really, you know, we're not able to work as much. Um, we see a problem that's going on and your average lawyer is going to try and do something about it, whether it's bringing the case or defending the case, whatever it may be. Um, and this was an opportunity where I knew, as you can see, a lot of us were sitting at home waiting to pounce on something that was worthwhile. Um, and it, it just, it was common sense, you know, something that we could easily do if we just get people aware of it. Um, and it's something not as technical as trying to go through the hill we went through to get those masks um, and give them out where a simple meal can change someone's demeanor or, you know, happiness or, you know, just let them know somebody actually cares um, with, the stress, with the stress that they're dealing with. So, you know, something small, but it's, you know, I think meaningful. Right. And Barbara, with you, um, you also jumped in and helped with the project. Um, is this more of an appreciation for nurses and doctors? What was your reason for wanting to jump right on? So when Jeb sent me an email this morning and said, hey, I think that you might be interested in helping us on this, I was like, of course I am. Um, it's perfect, right? Because I know here locally where I am, we've got a couple of local restaurants that are owned by my neighbors. I mean, these are the people that I play tennis with and I go to the swimming tennis club with and, you know, see walking our dogs at night. And they are, um, they're really scared that they're going to lose their business and they're, you know, they're going to have a hard time feeding their family. So I actually kind of came at it from a slightly different perspective than Chris. Chris looked at it more from the healthcare workers side, it sounds like, because he's got those intimate relationships. My relationships are with the bar that's a mile and a half down the road uh, and that I want to do my best and my part to keep going. And I can only drink so much to go bourbon. <laughs> uh, this is a great opportunity to help those folks as well. Absolutely. And I'll ask the same question to you, Moses. Yeah, you know, um, this all got started, I think, when I saw Chris showing up with a bunch of boxes of 3M masks, a bunch of hospitals. And I just thought, what an amazing thing, uh, number one, for someone to be able to find masks these days, but to deliver them to his community. And I just thought that was just an amazing display of generosity and uh, just caring uh, that you don't see very often, especially amongst lawyers, because we're so busy doing our jobs. And uh, now that we have some free time to be doing other things, we should be using our talents and our gifts and our time and our efforts uh, to be helping other people, especially the people that need it most. And I had reached out to Chris and uh, let him know that I wanted to help out with something. And uh, he in turn reached out to me and Jeb did so as well. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I specialize in medical malpractice cases. So the only time short of my doctor friends and nurse friends that I interact with on a social level, uh, the only time I really have an opportunity to interact with other doctors is either in litigation and work um, or in an adversarial role involved in a case. And so I, I, I want people to know that we need good doctors and we need good lawyers. There's such an important part. Guess where I'm going if I get sick? I'm going to the hospital and I'm going to need doctors and nurses take care, taking care of me or my loved ones. 
And uh, in my line of work, it's only just a small, small percentage of uh, situations that we get involved in. Uh, but there are a lot of excellent and amazing uh, doctors and nurses who are amazing people. And let's not forget their people um, with families and kids and spouses, their brothers and sisters, mothers and fathers. And, and there's nothing that uh, brings people together than sharing a meal or giving a meal. And I just thought this was such an amazing idea uh, just to help all those people on the front lines to let them know that we appreciate them and they're doing a great thing for everybody. Absolutely. And Jeb, you said that you're coming in from um, also an attorney. You deal with personal injury. Do you feel like the legal community also needs to step up more? I do. Um, I feel like it's, it's, like, it's not almost a question of should we, but can we? And the answer to that is yes, so why not? Mm -hmm. I guess. Um, I was on the phone yesterday about a case with a buddy of mine in another part of the state whose wife is a teacher. And he told me, um, I can't say his name, because he told me that his family had actually, like when this whole thing started a long time ago, had uh, gotten real sick. And it turned out it was COVID-19. They didn't know it at the time until it got real, real bad. And then there was like an email going around the school that someone had had COVID and a lot of the other teachers got like, really alarmed by that and wanted to know who it was. And I thought about it. That really sort of hit me because it's so scary from all angles. You know, suppose you're another teacher in, in that school. Well, you know, it's understandable that you want to know who it was. But if you're my buddy's wife, then you feel excoriated. For, I mean, you didn't do anything wrong. You didn't try to get COVID. You contracted it before everybody was quarantining themselves. I mean, it's just alarm. Um, and I feel like we're we have some advantages now in 2020. The question, the extent to which we leverage them uh, to keep ourselves out of trouble is an open question, but you know, we have some opportunities and I just hope that um, we, can, we can take advantage of them. We know more than we did in 1918, that, that deadly flu epidemic. And so, you know, I feel like if we do our job right, then, you know, we can avoid, um, ended up someplace like this. Hmm. Wow, you're getting good with this. <laughs> I was working on my Zoom. I was, I was practicing a little bit. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, you know, I, I just hope we can avert disaster to the extent that we can. And it's just a question of social will. So it's encouraging to see lawyers um, come together and, and work together when we have the chance. Mm, so then that segues into the next question. You know, we're hearing a lot about the coronavirus. Um, exactly in terms of severity, what are you all's thoughts on, you know, what you think personally of what's going on with this virus? Um, how serious do you think that is causing with our businesses? Um, you know, are we too late taking, you know, this COVID-19 seriously? Uh, what is the peak expected in three to four weeks from now? Like, what are your thoughts? So I'll put that question to Moses. I'll go ahead and start with you. Oh gosh, this is the question I didn't want to answer. <laughs> I, mean, you know, I really hate. Uh, by the way, I like your picture in your background, Chris. That's where we should all be at the beach on the island. Yeah, I'm, I'm dreaming right now. <laughs> <laughs> I really hate, you know, pontificating on stuff like this because there's so many uh, people who do know what they're talking about um, on the news, uh, talking about these issues. And unfortunately, there's people that don't know what they're talking about talking on the news about these issues. So I'll just leave it at this. This is, uh, I think, beyond what anyone ever imagined even three, four weeks ago uh, in our world. I mean, three, four weeks ago, we were sitting in our offices going to depositions. I was in New Orleans a day after Mardi Gras taking a deposition, and I went to Disney World with my kids. And uh, after we came back, we found out that someone there had coronavirus. And you can just see the massive impact it's had, not only in our community, but across the world. And unfortunately, I'm sure uh, many of us have had some connection to someone who's already passed away from coronavirus. So this is very sadly much bigger uh, than anyone ever expected it to be. And as you can see by the sheer fact, we're all sitting at home in front of our computers. The impact is massive from my perspective. I just hope and pray that these business owners and people who live paycheck to paycheck can really just hang on and we can figure out a way to help them hang on um, so that we can get through this together. But uh, I think it's, it seems, at least to me, uh, to be uh, worse than I had expected. Mm. So Chris, what about you? 
Um, and what are your thoughts around the coronavirus? Uh, just that it's real. I mean, you know, the other thing, which is probably why I'm such a, um, I started prepping for this months before it happened, um, is because, you know, I, before I was a lawyer, I worked in the public health field. So I used to work for the EPA um, and lived in Chicago. And I I was on the team that would go out to a toxic tort site and we're trying to figure out why everybody has cancer or why everybody has whatever ailment. And I've been in situations where we've had to put on PPE gear. And I was thinking in my head, is this worth it? Like coming to this little town in the middle of nowhere, risking my life because I know the toxic tort levels are off the charts. I already know what's going on. Why am I risking my life to try and figure out, you know, which creek it is that's polluted um, and why 35 people have cancer in a town the size of 1,500 people, which, you know, is just ridiculous. Um, so I, I went through years of that. And when I left the EPA to go to law school, um, I just started, I, you know, I always get flashbacks to this because there's, we're not built as a country to deal with these kind of situations. Um, and I've seen on the smaller scales, like when it hits a town like that, they're not built to deal with the fallout of everybody being sick at one time. And so I always feared that something like this would happen where it's in every city. Um, so that's why I, I drive my wife crazy buying weird stuff like um, full body uh, pollution suits and hazmat gear randomly like in December or goggles and just weird crazy stuff because I'm just always remember those days with EPA seeing how bad things can get. Um, and as soon as they said that this was hitting in America, I knew it was going to get bad because it's hard for us to not want to shake people's hands or hug each other or go to the mall or go play basketball with each other. Even if they say, hey, you go outside and play basketball or go running, you're going to get sick. 50% of us are going to say, eh, it's not going to happen to me. Mm -hmm. And they're still going to do it. Um, but it hits home. I mean, my wife's uncle died and I've got family members sick with it. So, I mean, it's, it's real. So do you think that we were a little too late taking COVID-19 a little seriously? Well, yeah, but I don't think it's necessarily anybody's fault. It's, it's one of those things, you know, it, we've never dealt with this kind of thing before. It's like if you have your first war, you don't really know how battles operate. I mean, we just, we, we've written books about preparing for this, but we've never had to face something like this. The beautiful thing about it is, it reminds me of when 9-11 happened, how everybody got unified. You know, that was the first time I've seen black, white, rich, poor, and I was in New Orleans at that point. I mean, you go down the street, you're high-fiving a random dude walking down the street. Like, you know, like everybody had little American flags, like for no reason. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of reminding me of that, how when the tragedy happened, everybody started unifying, which is a great thing. Mm. And Barbara, do you think that this situation could get worse before it gets better. What are your thoughts around the coronavirus? Hell, I have no idea. <laughs> I was the opposite of Chris when they uh, they started talking about this thing when back in late February-ish, uh, my husband is smarter than I am and pulled all the money out of the stock market and went to Costco and he didn't hoard, there was no hoarding. Mm -hmm. Uh, but he got, you know, with tuna fish and oatmeal and peanut butter and all kinds of stuff, just, you know, protein bars in our laundry room now because we have no other place to put it. Uh, so he kind of saw this coming. I didn't. I, I was on an airplane as late as the 17th of March. Wow. I truly did not. I just thought everybody's, I mean, honestly, I was one of those people that thought everybody's acting crazy. Um, so I was the anti-Chris Stewart. <laughs> um, that being said, I'm, I'm respecting, I'm respecting it. I'm respecting the, uh, everybody's, you know, ordering to stay at home, flatten the curve. And I'm agreeing to that. I'm not happy about it. Uh, and I do hope that 
that these estimates are wrong, these estimates that put us into the middle of summer, man, I hope that's wrong. Yeah. I really do. Yeah. So Jeb, do you have anyone in the medical field who are helping to fight this pandemic? Um, and how are they feeling now, if you do know anyone? You know, um, I know a couple of people who, and then sort of when they talk to me, I have to, they swear me to secrecy. So I can't say a heck of a lot about it, but you know, there are a lot of good folks who are pretty afraid. Um, I was closer to Barbara than Chris. I, I do not and have never owned, you know, a hazmat suit or a gas mask. <laughs> um, and, and I was kind of talking big. I would drink Corona beers and take pictures of myself and think I was funny. I don't think this is funny anymore. Um, the, the the folks that I've talked to who are in the medical space and there's some people who are in hospital administration um, are just alarmed. I suppose that's good. I mean, we want them to be ready, right? Um, they're going to off his lights again. We want them to be ready, but they've got patients in spaces where they didn't expect to have patients. They've got staff there around the clock. And, and that's the reason for this organization, you know, the people against COVID-19, is to try to help with at least one aspect of that that we lawyers can help with. That's raising money to pay for food. Um, so it's spooky. I, I've heard folks say it may last into the summer. Honestly, I kind of hope they're right because I hope it doesn't go any longer than that. Um, we may not have a virus for 12 to 18 months. So I don't know what to expect. Wow. I, I, it is nice. I'll quit rambling here in a second. I, I, Chris said something that I thought was really nice. And that is that you have seen in troubled times, people band together and they kind of always do. Um, I was thinking about this call before we got on it. And it reminded me of a book I read a long time ago called Tribe by Sebastian Younger, who was, was right to the war. And he was writing about a situation far more dire than this, the people in London in World War II when the Germans were bombing them constantly. And in preparation for that, the authorities in London had sort of built out their psychiatric care facilities, even in the 1940s. They were ready for an uptick in depression and suicide and all these things, and it never came. In fact, the sort of mental health of the population improved because people banded together. Um, and it's interesting to see that happen here. It, we have to all live apart, so we're not together in any literal sense. But, you know, I guess we're fortunate that this happened at a time where we could disseminate information quickly uh, through the Internet and Facebook and everything else. And, and we can't get together on Zoom. You know, this, this wouldn't happen in 1918. Mm. And does anybody else have, like, I guess a general question, does anybody else have anybody in the medical field who's, you know, experiencing short of masks, ventilators, um, medical staff that's worried? Have you heard anything through the grapevine? And what are your experiences, you know, hearing that? Anybody? No? Nobody knows anybody personally? Have you um, represented anybody, Barbara, who's, I don't know if you can talk about it, but who's involved? Sure. I mean, of course, I've got clients who are out there in the hospitals. Um, you know, one of the lawyers in my firm is a former registered respiratory therapist. Mm. That's what he does is intubate people, or that's what he did before he went to law school. Um, but as far as people who are out there right now, front lines within my family, nobody. I got lots of people in other disciplines. You know, I have a friend who's a dermatologist who said, Jesus Christ, if I've got to start intubating people, y'all are in bad, bad shape, man. Y'all need to stay home. <laughs> You're not going to have to intubate people. <laughs> you know? Yeah, we we probably had, how can I say this without saying names or getting them in trouble? Two doctors by the house a day since last week to pick up masks, even if it's just for like themselves. Uh, because they're worried or scared or they're reusing um, the one mask that they were given. Um, and so literally it's been like a revolving, my neighbors probably think I sold drugs or something because <laughs> it's like, it's like cars just constantly coming. Um, but they're all, you know, doctor packages. Yeah, really. Hey, hey, here you go, buddy. Um, but you know, it, it's, it's scary. And I try not to freak people out 
uh, and repeat like what they say, but um, it's it's scary. You know, I mean, you've got very well respected like ER doctors and trauma doctors reusing a mask because they don't have any or being told that they're going to be out of mask completely for the whole hospital in five days. And we haven't even reached the like apex yet. So, you know, mm -hmm. it's um, concerning. Um, and it's just, it's just trying to get people to really realize like how serious it is because the other problem with it is, um, and I know the government, I'm, I've seen a press conference and so I understand government science talk is you don't, you know, Kigo, you don't want to freak people out. This is a new virus. So all the stuff they say of what it does and how it affects you, they don't know. They're best guess. So, so we don't know who it really, you know, how it works and if kids can get it and if animals, you know, they were saying no animals can pass it. Now a damn tiger has it, you know, so it's mm -hmm. it it it's a novel virus which means new we don't fully get it yet and so that's what's scariest to me um and why you know it's all hands on deck and trying to get people to flatten the curve or help the doctors because they're figuring it out um so enough with my doomsday no absolutely that totally you know Totally makes sense. And it's kind of scary. It definitely is a scary time. Um, and I'll do a general question to everybody and I'll just go one by one. Um, but I'll start with you, Moses. How has the COVID-19 pandemic affected you personally? Well, uh, luckily, everyone in my family um, is well. Um, I do have a brother-in-law who actually did have coronavirus, but he works at Emory and his job was to keep track of the doctors and nurses who got sick and then of course he got sick but he's doing well now um so luckily he's on the other side of that so personally uh, at least from a health standpoint uh, we're doing fine obviously there's been a big disruption in the, the way that we do business but we're still able to do what we do um not taking as many depositions these days um, but still able to work on other things. And so um, in, in terms of the most important thing in our health, it, it hasn't really affected us, um, except for my brother-in-law who's now doing well. For, uh, uh, for the less important matters, it's business as usual, but it has impacted us. We just do it a different way. That's positive, that's good. Uh, what about you, Jeb? How has the COVID-19 pandemic affected you? You know, I've been relatively unaffected that you know, in the narrowest personal sense, we've had some scares. My um, my father's a lawyer too, and was down at the Capitol during some of the, from the legislative session this year and shook the hand of a, a senator who later turned out to be diagnosed with COVID-19. So we were all spooked for a minute, but yeah. um, everyone escaped that without symptoms. It, it hurts for some of my clients. I'm sure that's true for all of us. I mean, you've got people who, need help whose cases need to move forward and that's slowed down uh, we can't do in-person depositions effectively hearings are slowed down i don't know when the next time we'll have a jury trial is Oof. so you know it, it sort of hurts from that perspective but we're able to move forward i think um personally my, my kids are fine we, we just got some chickens for them to chase around the yard and keep them occupied and that's been good did you really yeah, yeah, I'm a chicken farmer now. You've got to send me some pictures. I oh, will. The names are, are Reba and Gladys. They're Rhode Island red hens. Oh, and they lay eggs just about every day. This is going in the group chat. <laughs> 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 so it, we've, been, we've, been, we've been well personally. I just, uh, you know, we feel for those who are more affected by who had gig jobs even if they don't have the coronavirus and, and who are hurting. Wow. And what about you, Barbara? Mine, are, I, mine response is the same as uh, mm -hmm. Jeb. I'm really, really fortunate that this has not impacted uh, my family personally. It's affected their jobs. My sister has been laid off from her job. She works for a company that uh, has a lot of the gift shops and um, food in the uh, airports all around the world, uh, including right here at Hartsfield. So she's been laid off. Uh, my brother works for Delta, so uh, he started his job on 
March 16th, which is obviously the day that everybody went in quarantine. So, uh, like, wow, that's crazy. Right. So other than, you know, I mean, but at the end of the day, they, you know, both of them have advanced degrees. They're going to be fine. Um, and as long as everybody's healthy, we did have to keep my mom and dad off of a damn cruise ship. They were supposed to leave for a flipping cruise down to South America. And they said, well, if we got to be quarantined, why not be quarantined on a damn cruise ship? <laughs> yeah, I said, well, it sounds great until you can't dock anywhere. Yeah, <laughs> and then you've got dead bodies on the cruise ship. Let's not do that. But <laughs> That's like the extent of our hardship. My parents couldn't go on a cruise. Right. Oh, that's the lucky. Knock on wood. Oh, right, right. That, that was a good call you made, not letting them go on that. Yeah. Right. And Mr. Stewart, what about you? How has this affected you personally? Um, I mean, like I said, you know, we have family members that, that are dealing with it or have dealt with it. Um, but the biggest thing, just seeing the toll, like I said, on my friends that are doctors, mm -hmm. um, and seeing their faces when I'm looking at them through the glass as I hand them a uh, a mask, it's it's rough, you know. It's kind of like they're like literally like war, like the front line soldiers, while we're just like at home, like wishing them luck. Um, and a lot of them are mothers and fathers. And so, you know, I was talking to one of my other friends the other night, and she was crying because she has a five year old kid, and she doesn't want to not do her job so her risk is you know what if kids can get it um and she's you know in the er every night so stuff like that um mm -hmm. and then like barbara said i mean you know most businesses don't just save money so like your local barbecue shack or bar they don't have six months revenue saved uh rainy day fund they live weekend to weekend with customers. So if you are not able to have customers that can, you know, end the business. So, you know, this is really a good way to support, you know, both sides. Okay. Well, I think that that is all. I think the last question kind of segued into how everything is affecting you personally. So, um, you know, and I think you guys also touched on how it's affecting your business as well um, and how you guys are moving on with business. So um, I believe that's all of my questions. And see, 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 Barbara, that's my actual uh, outfit. Wow. <laughs> where do you, yeah. where exactly do you buy something like that? Like, hey, where, where are you coming up with this stuff, dude? You, you're the only man in America with a mask. You have an Apollo 11 suit. <laughs> I just want to know how many masks you got stashed away in your bunker in, in, in your back. <laughs> None. <laughs> Nobody believes you. <laughs> All right. Jeff's got the chickens. I've got the mask. If you are. <laughs> hey, I've got, got the booze. All right. I've got, I got the booze. Got the booze. I mean, hey, y'all got to chip in something if y'all want to come to our containment shelter. <laughs> <laughs> this is the hot price thing. I'll bring Thank the liquor. You. Thank you. Jeff, got the chickens. The questions and thanks, Chris, for getting this whole thing going. Thank you. Oh, thanks, yeah. guys. Thank you, Tiffany. No problem. No problem. Thank you. All right, y'all. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.